people still jump in. I don't think it's, we can probably still do this by the end, but uh, there's lots of time for questions. So even as we're going through, if there's anything you, uh, question you want, or want some more detail about something, want to veer off on a bit of a tangent, just shout out and let's, you know, make this interactive. Uh, my name is Martin Anderson Klutz. I'm from Digital Echidna, in case you couldn't tell. And um, yeah, here to give you all a sense of uh, what we can do to make Drupal fast, our Drupal websites. Um, so first, let's start about talking about why is it important if our site is fast. I mean, as long as it does the right things, it doesn't really matter whether that page loads in 12 seconds or 6 seconds or 2 seconds. Well, here are some business examples of where making some small technical adjustments actually made a quite sizable and measurable uh, difference to the business. And you know, you can look at these slides afterwards. I won't go into reading all of them, but to me, the big, big one that calls out is Netflix as an example, where by tweaking a single optimization, uh, they were able to uh, cut their outbound network traffic in half. And if you can imagine what Netflix as a company pays for outbound bandwidth, you can imagine how much money that single tweak managed to save them. So think about uh, some of these optimizations and the difference that they could make to your business, whether it's in hosting, as well as some other things that we're gonna talk about. But not just in terms of why important or speed is important to you, think about why it's important to your users. Um, so here's some stats around what users expect from the speed of a web page. Uh, more than half expect a page to load in two seconds or less. Um, lots of them say that they'll abandon a site that takes more than three seconds to load. And um, as soon as it goes you know, one second beyond that, you start losing customer satisfaction. Um, again, almost half of online uh, shoppers say that a slow site is one that they're not going to return to. And one that I find really startling is that almost all mobile dispute mobile users expect the page to be faster on their mobile device, even though lots of times they may be accessing it over a slower network. So think about that in terms of how you build that page and that experience for your mobile users. Definitely one of the culprits here is uh, bloat uh, of web pages. So here's an article that was in um, Wired last year, talking about how the average uh, web page size was, had now reached um, actually, in this case, surpassed uh, the original size of the Doom application, you know, the game that people download and install on their computers and play for hours. Every single web page, on average, was, was bigger than that whole application. And the irony here is that, actually, at the time, the Wired homepage was even well in excess of that average. So they were as guilty as anyone. But back to the benefits of being quick, there's definitely a user experience um, part of that. And, I guarantee that whoever paid for your website to exist wants it to do more than just exist. They have goals for it and as we've talked about, to the extent that you're making the site better for your users, you're going to improve your conversions and your ability for your site to do better against those goals, which in an e-commerce standpoint may translate into sales or dollars. Um, but there are also SEO benefits to uh, having a fast site. Since 2010, uh, Google has cited um, Page speed is a ranking factor and also indicated that anything above two seconds to load will uh, slow down or impede their ability to crawl your site. So think about those two factors and, and how much SEO traffic you could be losing by having a slow site. So let's talk about performance from more of a conceptual standpoint and understand some of the um, deeper topics within um, performance. So this is a very crude model of what a typical request to a web page looks like. Uh, the user sends a request to the web server for a page. That goes through Drupal, which then pulls information out of the database, gets that back, does some more complicated things, sends that back to the user, and then um, based on that information that it's retrieved, then the browser goes out and fetches a bunch of more assets, you know, images, JavaScript, all of those kinds of things. This is... Um, demonstrating some typical elements that you would find in that scenario. So the browser maintains its own cache, so if uh, it already has loaded previously some of those things, those assets, for example, then it might not need to go out um, to the web server to get those. And 
Uh, Drupal has its own caching mechanism so that to the extent that it has some of these things pre-rendered, it can serve them up again without having to go uh, deeper and retrieve more data or do more application logic. Um, PHP has what's called an opcode cache. So PHP is runtime compiled, which means that it takes all of the readable code and compresses it down to things that can run more quickly, and an opcode cache just saves that compressed code uh, so that it can be reused again and again and make the page load faster. And then in a highly optimized scenario, we, we start to get a bunch more elements. So, um, it doesn't seem to bring a point of order. So Varnish is, is a reverse proxy server. It basically will store the fully rendered page and uh, serve that back to the user to the extent that it, um, the request that it sees is the same as one that it's seen previously. Um, there are different things that we can do in terms of um, caching not only the whole page, but by even some data. And so this is sort of within the, the web server or also between the web server and MySQL. There are some, some optimizations, and maybe we'll talk about those later. And then the other piece that you can do is, is a content delivery network. And what that does is it has a network of nodes uh, across the globe often. And uh, the idea is that those uh, requests can be satisfied from a point that's physically much closer to the user. So that rather than having to retrieve assets from, let's say, a data center in Atlanta, if they're in London, England, they might be able to uh, get those assets from a data center in Manchester, as an example. So it's that idea of reducing or um, increasing the uh, physical proximity of those files. But the general thing to think about when you look at this is that the closer to the user you can satisfy that request, the faster it's going to be for them. So, in general, you always want to put the mechanisms in place to satisfy it as early as possible before it has to all go all the way up to the database and pull all of that data out fresh. So, in terms of measurement, how do we measure performance? So uh, an early one was page load, which is just from the time the browser requests the page, how long does it take until that, that page, uh, you know, the fully rendered HTML um, page comes back from the server. Um, but that incorporates only the page as opposed to a, a more holistic way, which is the full page load, which includes things like uh, JavaScript, uh, images, maybe third party assets, all of those kinds of things. Uh, page render starts to look at it from more of a user experience standpoint in the sense that page render starts to look at um, not only the time for all of those things to come back, but then for the browser to actually you know, render out all of the different CSS, execute JavaScript, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, first Paint builds on that idea by measuring what's the, the first point at which um, the browser starts to, to render something. So, where the user isn't just seeing a white page, but actually starting to see your site, and time to interact uh, builds on that by saying, what's the lapse then before they can actually start doing things on the page? And if you're looking at perform performance on more of a macro level, then um, request per second is useful by, by starting to see you know, what's uh, a bulk number of requests per second that that server is capable of serving. So in, some, in terms of the tools that we can use for measuring, um, there are online tools like uh, webpagetest.org, alert site, I think there are even some Amazon instances you can spin up for remote monitoring, but basically the idea is you point it to a URL, you tell it um, how many tests to perform, and then it'll go out. Uh, oftentimes you want to give it a number of them to do so that you can average out any uh, kind of network effects, um, and then it'll give you a sense of, um, you know, how fast is it, where are the bottlenecks, are there certain elements that are, are slow. Uh, why slow and Google PageSpeed are both kind of browser extensions you can use that will give you a sense of um, where the problems are, give you some recommendations on how you can improve speed. And Google Analytics, there's some information there that that uh, you can mine in terms of understanding um, page speed more from the perspective of your user, which is useful because um, remote monitoring, you're picking a location to measure from. Uh, y slow and Google page speed are giving you data versus where you are. Um, but Google Analytics is really from the perspective of, of your actual customers. You know, 
how fast is it taking for them? And so that sometimes that's important to look at too. And then New Relic can give you a sense of performance, but actually starting to dig down into code. So let's look at some of these tools quick. Here's a web page test. So you can see across the top, we've got some of those um, average kind of scores. And then it's also drawing vertical lines that correspond to some of those things that we talked about. So the, um, the first paint you can see is on there. Uh, to the far right, document complete is, is when everything is fully rendered. And so as you look down on the report, and you can see all of the various parts of the of this single page, uh, the home page of a website. All of those various uh, elements being loaded, um, it's showing you all of the um, the different domains that they're loading from in the file, and uh, and you can see based on the bars. And let me just flip back to the top, so you can see um, the green is the time to first byte, so that's the delay before. Um, anything starts to come back and then the blue is the actual time for the asset itself to load. So for a number of these, there's actually more of a wait than, than the time for the asset itself to load. And that really talks to the, the, the power of things like aggregation because rather than having to make a bunch of requests, each of which has its own delay, you can load one aggregate asset that then you know satisfies um, the same end goal. Um, Here's another thing that you can see further down in the report, which is taking all of those things but looking at it on a connection view, um, which is useful because you can start to see what are the actual elements or um, domains that are, are giving you the biggest slowdown. So when we ran this report from one of our clients, the thing that really jumped up for us was this one here. And uh, when we did some digging that uh, YTIMG is actually uh, YouTube assets. The client had asked to have the uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube video embedded on their home page and what we started to realize when we looked at this report was that all of the assets that that meant loading on page view were dramatically slowing down the actual load, uh, page loads. So we were able to kind of dummy it in with the static version and then on hover swap it in for the real player and, and that dramatically improved our, our page load time. Um, this is looking at uh, why slow. So you can see here, it'll, it'll give you kind of a, a letter grade on all the different aspects of your web page. Um, it'll make some recommendations, um, you know, where it sees discrepancies against what it would consider best practice. Um, and then it'll also give you a breakdown in terms of the types of assets. And then if you expand it the way uh, JavaScript is expanded here, it'll show you the individual ones, both uncompressed and if it is compressed, what was the compressed size? So the, again, you can start to see what are the different elements within each of those categories and which ones are contributing to the bloat of your web page. And it gives you this nice pie chart so you can also see which ones are, are well suited for caching. So um, on a return visit, you know, what would be the difference in speed for um, you know, an empty versus a primed cache? Here's a similar view of what uh, the Google PageSpeed Insights would look like. One of the nice things here is that uh, it actually has recommendations specific to both mobile and desktop. Um, but again, you can see that it, it has very specific places where it'll say, you know, we think you could make your web page better by fixing these, you know, specific things. So here's an example of uh, Google Analytics, and you can see some of the elements here where, um, again, it's giving you, um, and this is more site-wide in this particular case, average paid load time, uh, average server response, all of those kinds of things, but on more of an aggregate level, it is possible to drill down. So you can see here where it's actually looking on sort of a per URL basis. Um, some of the gotchas or potential gotchas here are that sometimes depending on which variables you're telling it to ignore, it may aggregate up together a bunch of things that really, from a user experience standpoint, feel like different page loads. So the top one here is index.php, which I think for this particular site, and you can tell by the number five down there, that this was an older web application that took parameters um, almost as really the true uh, page URL. So to the extent that it was ignoring ones, it was rolling up together a whole bunch of pages on the site. And you can tell by the drop off you know, from that one to the ones below that really what you'd want to do is, is have it break some more of those out. Um, this is looking at uh, New Relic, which is an application that um, 
gives performance monitoring, but really more from a server perspective. And uh, the benefit there is that it can actually tell you uh, what parts of the code are starting to uh, slow down or, or um, cause things to run slower, Wh which ones are taking the most time. So here's an example of where it's, it's showing the transactions that are the most con uh, time consuming overall for the, uh, for the site. Um, and it gives you those nice charts. I mean, one of the th things that's nice ab about um, New Relic as well is that because it gives you that time basis, you can also pay attention, for example, if you're launching modifications to um, some of your code, if you see a corresponding spike, you can start to know, you know, that looks like it may have negatively impacted the performance when we launched that thing. So there are some, some things that way where you can look at it, you can compare it to uh, prior measurements and some of those kinds of things. And here's another example, again, uh, based on the transaction, which is really uh, sort of the PHP function uh, with some of the charting, but you can also look at it on a module basis. So to see, you know, in this case, views was number two, but there was this um, looks like a custom module that was that was really chewing up resources and slowing things down. Uh, show of hands, was anybody in the um, the previous session on PHP profiling next door? So all of that stuff on Blackfire was great. I mean, that's even a deeper view in terms of you know the code and being able to look at uh, very specific measurements, uh, not only at a function level but but even you know the child functions. So. Um, if this, this is the kind of work that you're going to get really deep on, then, then definitely something like that could be useful. Uh, so what are some of the ways that you should look at performance in terms of understanding your audience? I mean, certainly geography is one. If uh, almost all of your customers or visitors are going to be coming from Canada, then, you know, it makes sense to, to look at measuring the, the, um, the site in ways that relate to that geography. In a similar way, if they are all going to tend to be use, using, let's say, older browsers or handheld devices, um, you know, calling in from rural networks, uh, those kinds of things, then understanding your audience can help you to uh, measure the site that are appropriate to your particular application. And what are some of the key factors in terms of performance? What are the things that can make your site faster or slower? Well, as we've already talked about, page weight is a big one. So if you have giant images and you're you know, rendering out 18 pages of content every time the home page is loaded, those things are going to slow down your site. Uh, the number of requests, as we looked at, you know, if you've got 300 elements that have to be loaded in from 60 different domains for every page request, um, that's going to slow things down and, and third-party assets, that touches on that too because um, particularly for what are called blocking elements, so the things that have to be retrieved and rendered before the page is visible, the slowest of those things will impact the user's perception of your site. So you may be loading things that are part of the layout engine um, that are coming from a server that's really slow and even though your server is really fast, the user's perception is that the site is slow even though it's not anything that's specific to your server. So to the extent that you cannot rely on third-party assets, um, you're probably going to find you do better uh, with performance. Um, delivery, so you know the, the speed of your server and the connection that it has to the internet, all of those things uh, will definitely be a factor. Uh, server we just talked about, and then also just the complexity of your code. So if you're running, you know, a Drupal application with 300 modules and um, a bunch of front, front end widgets all embedded in it, all of those things are going to negatively impact your speed. So uh, does anybody have any things that we haven't talked about in terms of, um, you know, methods or tools that they like to use for diagnosing speed issues? Uh, all right, well, let's move on. So let's talk about what are the things that we can do to, to improve speed. So the biggest one is to just keep it simple. Um, to the extent that we don't have to have, you know, you know, 60 images on the home page and, you know, an interactive chat widget and, you know, all the latest, you know, JavaScript, Ajax, headless, sex <coughs> it, To the extent that we can keep it simple, it's going to make our life easy in terms of uh, keeping the site simple. So trying to understand that as part of the overall site concept is definitely very important. So part of our strategy should really be to do less. So to the extent that we don't need a bunch of libraries, that we don't need to load you know, 50 fonts from Google, 
um, that we don't need modules for things that really aren't required for the core user experience that we're trying to create. Um, try and leave those out of our, our site strategy. And some people have even gone so far as to build what's called a performance budget. So to set at the outset, what is our goal in terms of how fast the site should load? And then any time there's discussion around should we add you know, this gigantic image on the home page or you know, some other new site element, then that can be tied back to this performance budget and say, if it's so critical that we add that, then what can we give up to maintain our budget? Because we understand that we have this goal that we're being held to. Um, to that extent, um, has anybody ever been to this site? Should I use a carousel.com? It's great, right? So, so the whole idea is it presents a lot of uh, you know, relevant facts around you know, the effectiveness of uh, web page carousels, and particularly on home page, and I'll give you a spoiler that you should never use this at carousel is basically what it amounts to, so. Um, from a front end perspective, what things can we do to improve site performance? You know, definitely a big one is around images. Um, so we want to compress images as aggressively as we can without really visibly degrading them. Uh, don't make images, don't load images that are bigger than you're displaying them. I mean, oftentimes you'll see sites where they use CSS to shrink them and really we're loading much bigger images than we need to. Um, even lazy loading an image um, might be a, a consideration for some sites. If you have to have a lot of images, use JavaScript to make them only load as the user actually scrolls down so that they don't have the sense of waiting for all of those images to load. Um, some things, uh, particularly CSS libraries like Bootstrap, may have all kinds of CSS in them that do never actually gets used on that particular site. So to the extent that you can use CSS that's really pared down to what you're actually using, that will help. Same thing with JS. If you don't need a bunch of dynamic elements or things to be done in, in such a complicated way, if you can keep it simple and really only need the things that, use the things that you need, then that's going to help. Um, and then also there are, there's a technique around um, putting, again, elements, particular things around, um, you know, more advanced styling. If you can put those in the footer of the page, then it'll let the page be rendered as it's um, still downloading elements as opposed to forcing everything to load and then you get that sort of flash where everything appears. Um, and so then, again, from that first render perspective, you can help the user to feel like your site is, is uh, fast, even though it may, there may still be elements of it that are uh, loading and being more refined. We mentioned caching before, so this is uh, actually, uh, I think it's originally from Acquia, but it's on Drupal.org to, to sort of give you a visual sense of how cache works. Again, ideally, as much as possible, we would want to give the user a fully cached page, so, you know, a reverse proxy, you know, the exact page that the last anonymous user asked for, let's give them the exact same thing and it never even has to hit the web server. Varnish can um, satisfy that directly, but then moving down, you know, if you've got at least a page cache within Drupal, that will be relatively fast. And then if not, at least parts of the page you would want to have uh, rendered. So. Again, ideally as much as possible of, of the overall page you want to have cached. So from a site build perspective, definitely caching is a big one. Um, aggregating CSS and JS is another important one. Uh, again, from that idea of reducing the number of requests to the server. And, uh, and we'll talk later about some uh, fairly advanced ways to do that. Um, and then also not having modules enabled um, that aren't even in use. Uh, statistics is a big one. Oftentimes that's uh, enabled by default for sites um, that can really slow down the web server and oftentimes people aren't even using the data but it adds a lot of extra sort of database traffic to the overall website. Uh, UI modules is another one that we see in production. How often are people really tweaking their views? Oftentimes they're really just going into sort of update and edit content. So to that extent, leave things like views UI or field UI disabled so that you're not creating that extra memory overhead. And then search is another one. If you're on, let's say, Pantheon or Acquia, or even if you just want a better search experience for your users, you might look at using something like Solar, at which point you're, really, you're typically offloading all of the, um, the sort of computational overhead of indexing um, your web content and um, searching against that from the web server off into your Solar application. And so that can definitely help your website. <coughs> 
Uh, some modules that you can use include uh, the site audit, so that sort of renders out this long report about your website, um, has a lot of information about uh, caching, um, as well as a very variety of other best practices, so that can be a really good one to, to start with in terms of uh, showing you where the gaps are and where you can potentially have some, some really low-hanging fruit. Um, there's a module called advanced aggregation that can be really powerful. So you've got in core the ability to aggregate into single files, but in terms of um, making the best use of your connections between the browser and the server, sometimes people will find that it's better to have those broken up into two or three files. But you know, again, that's the kind of thing that you'll want to tweak and find, or find what works best for your particular application. I think it can also do some things like. Um, Keep local copies of some things like, let's say, Google Fonts, so that, again, you're not having those extra connections that um, your user has to go and like negotiate SSL with another server and you know, get the, the lapse, again, in terms of establishing those connections. Um, APDQC um, is uh, a module that does a lot to optimize the connection between your web server and your MySQL database, so that one can be quite powerful too. Um, if you're using entities on your site, um, in Drupal 7 you would want to add entity cache, that's actually part of core in Drupal 8. Um, Fast 404 is good, especially if you're transitioning from a non-Drupal site to, to one that is Drupal in the sense that if you're expecting to have a lot of 404 errors, um, you know, uh, web addresses that don't exist anymore. Rather than have Drupal serve up those 404s, Fast404 basically reroutes, reroutes those to static files so that they can be just served out of Apache cache as opposed to rendered through you know, the more expensive uh, Drupal engine. And then in a similar way, syslog, rather than um, writing through the watchdog system, which goes into the database, syslog actually writes to the, like the uh, Apache error log instead. So it's, again, much less overhead. And in terms of the hosting environment, to the extent that you have the ability to go in and sort of tweak the server, you can do things like making sure that uh, gzip is enabled for things like CSS and JS files. Uh, having a reverse proxy like Varnish um, or Boost is a, a huge help often. Uh, content distribution network, as we talked about, can be really, really powerful. Also can be kind of expensive, so it's probably not for everybody. Um, having a data cache like uh, a APCU is uh, really good and um, can, again, provide a really huge uh, performance benefit by reducing the amount of traffic between the web server and the, uh, the database. And then even the version of PHP that you're running, so PHP 7 um, is often much, much faster than older versions of PHP. So let's talk about what's uh, new in Drupal 8 that's related to performance. Um, as of Drupal 8, we now have full support for PHP 7, which is a big win. Um, as we talked about before, Entity Cache is now in core. And uh, there's also cache for login users. So Drupal 7 below had a really good caching mechanism for anonymous users, but the minute somebody was logged in, um, essentially all of that was being rendered on every page load. And uh, unless you use something like auth cache, but then uh, that was a contrib module that could help to solve that, but sometimes would run into sort of some configuration issues. So Drupal 8 has put a lot of work into that and it's much better. Um, you can declare asset dependencies. So things like, um, let's say, um, jQuery. Um, Drupal 7 and below would load jQuery for every page, whereas as of Drupal 8, um, it tries to only load it on those pages where it thinks it's actually necessary based on um, you know, what's been loaded into the page. So again, from that idea of trying to keep uh, things down to the actual minimum assets that are necessary. Um, in terms of cache, it can be much more granular in terms of what gets cached and under what context. And to that extent, there's actually this cache context API where you can even do custom declarations around, you know, if you have a certain type of customer or a geographic region that's custom to your particular company, you can declare what gets cached and when in a way that's really uh, tightly suited to your particular application. Um, and then uh, Drupal 8 also introduced this notion of uh, post-render cache, so the idea of putting an element into the page load for the sake of, of being able to send it back to the user, um, but it's actually going to get re-rendered um, after the page load, and uh, the idea being that um, 
if, for example, you have some elements on the page that are going to be dynamically generated, let's say it's um, you know most recent content, and you don't want that to be uh, you know cached for a set period of time, um, rather than having it so that the page is never cached uh, in Drupal 8, you can have it send sort of an empty block element that'll get replaced. And the best example of that is actually in uh, BigPipe. Has anybody here used BigPipe on one of their sites? Um, if you've used Facebook, you're probably actually familiar with BigPipe. Um, okay, let me just see what we get. Switch it. I'm going to just show you guys since we've got time for it. There's a demo that is on Drupal.org. See where it's showing that there are elements on the page that are not cached. So normally um, that would cause the uh, overall page to not be cached. What BigPipe allows is for the overall page to be sent through, and then as the slower elements are actually rendered out um, by the, the server, then it can push those elements and it replaces. Uh, those placeholder elements with the actual, you know, customized, uh, slower, uh, actual content. So you can see that, um, um, so it's not actually, in, in the examples they're showing, it's not actually reducing the render time so much as dramatically improving the user's experience of, of seeing that content because they see most of the page right away and then as those slower elements are available then it's pushing those through as opposed to making the user wait until the overall page is ready and then pushing that through as kind of a whole piece. Um, so that was what I was going to cover on uh, Drupal 8. <clears throat> And then I was just going to sort of open it up and say, you know, beyond what I've talked about here, does, does anybody in the audience have some thoughts around other things that they found helpful in terms of making their Drupal site fast? Uh -huh. Well, I will then uh, throw it open for questions. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that the Google page, uh, page speed tool recommends is taking the goal link elements that yeah. put your CSS and your page out on the head and having a JavaScript thing down on the bottom. Mm -hmm. and I don't understand why it is that that block, because like, I, I don't understand why JavaScript does it because it has to execute the JavaScript before it continues, but CSS, it's a local page, it just doesn't have a, have a styling for it yet. Um, it's because the, um, the CSS sometimes will have calls out to other things. So from the browser's perspective, it's waiting until it has those. It, it's, um, it hits those, it sees those, it makes those extra calls, and then it's waiting to get those back before it's gonna do its render. So by putting them in the block, it, then it's gonna go ahead and, and render what it has so far before it makes those calls even. Um, but again, that advanced aggregation module can do some of that for you. So you can basically check a box and say, move those things down, and it'll try to do some of that for you. Any other questions? Yeah. I think. Yeah, Google does actually have. I think if you if you read in there, there's a link off to the tool that it's using as sort of its baseline. But yeah, it it expects a very aggressive level of, of optimization, and you know, especially in those ones that have like the Google one where it has the numerical evaluation, you'll probably net never get a score of 100. percent So it's sort of understanding. Um, trying to aim to see progress as opposed to saying like, you know, I have to hit 98 to, to consider my optimization a success. Um, so it's, again, it really comes back to understanding what does success look like for your particular site. Um, I was looking at a site recently where like the home page took 12 seconds to load. And so, you know, from there, even if you can get that down to, you know, four, then that's a huge win for them. 
um, but it's still well above what Google talks about as guidance of two seconds or less, right? So, but progress is definitely always important. So. No questions? All right. Then I'll give you the rest of your day. That's all right.